For nylig udgav vi vores movie TV udsendelse om det amerikanske multitalent Crispin Glover. Skuespiller, musiker, kunstner, instruktør, ja, Glover kan nærmest det hele. Han er også god til at tale, og vi fik godt halvanden times materiale i kassen, da vi forleden talte med ham over Skype. I I actually don't think I'm that eccentric in my life. Interviewet er langt og utekstet, men vi synes altså det var synd, hvis fans ikke fik lov til at høre det hele. Husk at du kan tjekke enten videobeskrivelsen på YouTube eller nyhedsteksten på movie.dk for at finde ud af hvad vi taler om og hvornår. Hello Crispin. Hello, Johan, correct? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Am I coming through okay? Say one more time. Am I coming through okay? You can yes, hear me? Yes, all, all is clear. Perfect. Uh, you've you've written books uh, and yes. you've, you've written music, you've acted, you've directed. There's so many different avenues of, of artistic well, I, work. I, 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 to be fair, the, the record that I had out uh, was produced. I wrote... I wrote the lyrics and I performed the songs, but I actually didn't write the music. It was written by Barnes and Barnes, who had done other uh, records, and they they came to me actually not with an album idea at first. They just said they wanted to record some songs and I ha- or music, and I had uh, known some of the work. I thought it would be uh, a lark to do, uh, but it wasn't something I was planning to do or anything. Okay, but okay. Uh, but the books, uh, yes, I've I've made many books and uh, published. I published five and four are in print right now, and um, I'm planning to publish more because I've made the most of these. I made many many years ago. They're in the show that I'll be performing in Copenhagen, mm. uh, and I perform eight different books that are projected behind me. They're profusely illustrated, so. Um, The images uh, are behind me. The illustrations are part of the narrative, essentially. Hmm. Uh, and it's an hour-long show, and then I present the film, and then I have a Q&A, and then there's a book signing. Yeah. And I sit there till the last person has what they want signed, signed. I'm really looking forward to the show. Um, yeah, part but, of the show. Yeah. I've been for a long time now too. Yeah, yeah, I was just yeah. about to ask you that because it's you've been touring with the show and and, yeah. and, with, and the mo- movies included in it for so many years. So what is it about these stories in particular that makes you so passionate about it that you still want to tour the well, world with them? What's funny about them is that when I started making them, the first book I made in this fashion, they're old books from the 1800s that are reworked from different books from what they originally were. And some of them have some of the original text in the book, and many of them are just images that I found and ended up coming up with stories that are quite, they're all different from what the original books were. But I, I'm really very proud of them. I made most of them in the late 80s and very early 90s. Uh, but I didn't make them for this purpose. I just made them, I never thought I would be publishing them or touring with them all these years later. And yet I'm very proud of them. There's something that I, I think of it almost like a letter to myself f- as a younger person to me as an older person now. And and then I also feel like, well, good. I'm glad to my younger self that I, I did that. So, you know, in terms of like what you were saying at, when we first started here, uh, There is something about just doing something and uh, putting it forth, and then uh, people finding it interesting is is a good thing. That it became a show, and it was a good way to distribute my films. It's uh, I, I I've never put the films out digitally, so which is you know the, in this day and age that's just that's not the norm. Everything is becomes digital, but it made much more sense for me to take a slow approach. And over the years, you know, this is literally 13 years now. Is that right? Wow. This is what year? 1988. And I started touring with it. I premiered What Is It, which is the film that I'll be showing in Copenhagen this time. I, I was there a number of years ago showing the second film, Everything is Fine. I generally don't like to show What Is It by itself now. Uh, but anyhow, I premiered it in 2005 in Sundance. And this is 13 years later. <laughs> I didn't 
tour. I haven't toured much. I, this is the first time I toured this year, which is unusual. I think this might be the first year I've not toured in this amount of time since 2005. I could be wrong, but I think this is the longest I've not toured because uh, I was I've been working on American Gods, mm. uh, which has been a fairly uh, heavy schedule. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, what is it has a lot of things in it that people can get upset about. I, I tried, so I, I've, I've, I've had been hesitant in a while to show it on its own. I like showing everything is fine with it. And people can get upset about that one as well, but there's a different aspect to it. But there's something going on right now in the culture that I actually think it is very good to be showing what is it right now and uh, the kinds of questions that it was dealing with all of those years ago is absolutely pertinent to certain things that are going on right now, mm. which I'm, I'm glad of. I'm glad that the, I, I made something. And I, it's weird. I feel the same way about the books. And I feel more that way, the books that I've made and the films that I've made, than most of, by far than most of the films that I've acted in. Mm. So something about corporate films generally – I mean, it's, there's exceptions. There are exceptions, but generally, the corporate films are, are are specific to a time period that they're released in. Very good ones. Sometimes that they 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 last for a long time, but there's something about the fact that they are. Being funded by by corporate interests, corporate interests have a more confined amount of information that they feel comfortable with putting forth. Hmm. And as that's confined, it actually limits a lot of the expression, which then can limit to limit it to being a very very specific to what is happening at that that moment and not necessarily in a good way in a, in a way that it just it only reacts to that moment and then it becomes something that you put away and don't want to revisit mm. but that's something i'm proud of and happy about with both the films and the books is that they're made in such a way that they leave thoughts open for a so that they're interpretable a long time to come. Mm. And like I said, I think what is it is very pertinent to things that are going on right now. Mm. But is there like a sort of artistic realm that you feel more comfortable in than the others or something that you think is more gratifying in terms of, of writing, of, of, of performing? I, like of make, I actually really love making the books, but for whatever reason, that kind of energy went into making the films. Films, I used to make the books, I mean, I would take time making the books, but it's a very different thing because you're by yourself, you've got the pages that you're working with and the images and you can put it together and I, some of them I made very quickly and some of them I made over a period of years, it depended on the book, but you do it by yourself in a way that it, it doesn't take a lot of other stuff to happen. Filmmaking is very expansive and expensive, both. And uh, so I've been working on a film. I'll show a, a preview, a, a trailer uh, for it, like two minutes of something I've been working on for five years now. I've been shooting a production segment every year, essentially, for the past five years. I, I shot the initial film in about three and then I've expanded it in a certain way, uh, which I even just shot something this last April. Uh, but I've been working, like I said, on American Gods. I haven't had the opportunity to uh, uh, even sync up the sound. I'm shooting, this is a 35 millimeter negative that I'm shooting this film on. What is it? And everything is fine. My first two films, what is it, which I'll be showing in Copenhagen, was shot on a 16 millimeter negative and then blown up through a digital intermediate to a 35 millimeter print. And I'll be showing the 35 millimeter print in, in Copenhagen. 
Um, so it, it just these things take a long time. What is it? I, I actually started shooting What Is It? Even though I premiered it in Sundance in 2005, I started shooting the film in 1996. Wow. So this film is actually 22 years... I started making it 22 years ago. It's actually a very old film. But like I say, there are aspects of what I was reacting to that are still... Ab they're, like I keep saying, I, I actually think it's even more pertinent right now than it was even in 1996, strangely. Mm. What, what do you think it specifically is about modern culture and modern... What, what's going on in, in the heyday of today, of course, where so much is happening also, both culturally and politically, that you think your, your films really tap into? Well... When I was shooting the film... I... It started out to be a short film, but when I expanded it, it was a reaction to corporate constraints of that which um, would, uh, you know, it's funny, I, ha I haven't been talking about the film in a while, and there's <laughs> certain things that I'm, I'm, I usually have right on the top of my head to say that I, 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 I've, I've lapsed on them for a second, which is okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> But I, I normally have a thing that I say. Uh, but 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 uh, there 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 are questions that are um, you're not. <laughs> it's funny now. I want to say the thing that I was that I normally say. What is what what is it? Is a is my say? I'll I'll get into it. Yeah, my sure, sure. Reaction. <laughs> The corporate constraints that have happened in the last, well, at this point, more than 30 years of, of filmmaking, wherein anything that can possibly make an audience uncomfortable is necessarily excised, mm. or that film will not be corporately funded or distributed. There are things, though, I, I, this is, I started saying that thing I automatically have, have, there's something that's going on right now which is actually positive, but I'll, I'll say that in a minute. But... Um, Corporately, uh, where where in anything that can possibly make an audience member is necessarily excised, or that film will not be corporately uh, funded uh, or distributed, which is a very damaging thing, hmm. because it's that moment when somebody's asking a question that uh, there's genuine education, uh, and to to ubiquitously excise the possibility of genuine questions being asked. When people when people become uncomfortable, that can, it's not the only way that questions can be asked, but it, it can be a way that causes questions to be asked, which is actually a very positive thing. And um, to ubiquitously excise the possibility of, of questions, that leads to propaganda. And that's something that's happening in, in the culture right now. Although, like I was starting to say, I do see that there are things that are happening. So a lot of it does have to do with the internet. And it's not it's not about distribution on the internet, but it is about that there's a much clearer understanding, certainly than when I first started making the film. In 96, the internet was not as it is. And even in 2005, it wasn't what it is. It's, it's these last few years that a lot's going on with a genuine dialogue that people are able to analyze and, and comment upon propaganda that's going on in the culture. So like, particularly in the U.S., when I first started touring with the film, and I would talk about the U.S. as having propaganda, I could just tell that the audience was like, what is this person talking about? Hmm. Like... They thought, you know, like USSR or Nazi Germany or that kind of place is propaganda. Now, though, people, you know, as soon as I crossed even into the border of Canada, people knew what I was talking about. And certainly out, further outside of the U.S., well, even in Canada. But in the U.S., it was really very, like, difficult for people to comprehend that the U.S. had a propaganda system, which, of course, it has a very strong propaganda system in a lot of different levels. But um, that I'm very pleased. This is something I'm actually happy about because it's become a genuine point of conversation. And, 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 and even, you know, in these last couple of years, there's a lot of movements that are going on and, and people are reacting to this kind of control. I'm, I couldn't be happier about that. That, that I, 
I'm, I, I feel is like a very good thing. And, and that's part of what I think, what is it is, is reacting to, but there's also, I don't really like to be overly political and, and the film really is an artistic reaction. And yet, there are political elements on many levels when talking about something like propaganda. It's not all political, but something that happens, uh, I, I assume it happens in a lot of the Western world, but it definitely happens in the U.S., is things get separated onto right and left mm. at... Um, I don't know. I, I almost feel like that in itself is something that it's a propaganda of its own, just simplifying things into a right and left. Like people are much more complicated than right and left. Uh, but, you know, these things that we think about on the typically on the right are very evident mm. as being restrictive. But there are also things that happen on the left, if so to speak. I, I don't I, like. I say I don't like defining it that way. Liberal, conservative, left, right, whatever it is. There's. It's about people on on wherever they are on the political spectrum that are wanting to shut down conversation of any kind, mm. and that's really negative. Yeah. And what is it is something that wanted to open questions and conversations, whatever the political spectrum. And I've had reactions from different people all over the political spectrum as well. So that's something that I think, like I say, there's something going on right now where I'm seeing it happening of people all over the political spectrum that are wanting to shut down conversation. And of course, I'm see, seeing people all over the poli political spectrum that want to open the conversation as well, So, which is the positive aspect. Mm. But I think it's really commendable and, 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 and great that you actually, you, you, you take these movies with you on tour and you're, you're, you're making people see them on the big screen and see them for yeah. real, the, may, the way they were meant to be seen. Because I think yeah. it's so distressing how many people in this digital world watch their movies on their iPads and their iPhones and the, the well, whole... Well, there's a, a lot of movies that it's okay. Some of the interesting films that are being made are documentaries, and on some levels, sometimes those movies are okay to watch that way. It isn't necessarily made to be something up on the big screen, and they can be engaging to watch on YouTube or... or your telephone or what have you. But yes, these films I made specifically in that kind of concept of when I was going to see films in the 1980s that were revival house movies being shown and I got lost in that kind of the atmosphere of the lights going down and the big image being projected. And I, you know, it's, I wonder about that in general, you know, it's almost an outmoded art form like people do it there are big movies but the, particularly the films in the u.s right now not all of them but for the most part you know there are these kind of action essentially pro-war propaganda movies that are considered the blockbusters right now and I don't have interest in seeing. I very rarely go to see film. Actually, I'm in New York right now, and I I have been going to see old movies uh, at the at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, they had a great um, it was something curated by Mar Martin Scorsese uh, last few last month of uh, National Republic uh, features. I saw about eight of them. Mm -hmm. Two of which I, two of them I thought were really very, very good films. So the rest of them were interesting to see, but two were really very good. Mm -hmm. But I, that I, I do enjoy that still. But I, I hadn't been, it's hard, even in Los Angeles compared to New York, Los Angeles is difficult to find good 35 millimeter projection screens of interesting and varied venues there's i'm finding it's easier here in new york than in la right now mm. uh but you know that's that's why when i was in norway i their, their cinematech situation was very commendable 
Hmm. Uh, I don't know what it's uh, like in, in Copa, Copenhagen because I've only been there for the the festival before. I've not spent a lot of time time there yet. And we have a great cinema take, and of course that's actually where your show. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And now it was it was actually switched from a different venue, so I'm I'm glad. I love showing at Cinematex. Those are the often the best theaters to show in. Yeah, it's really it's a really nice place, and they they screen a lot of old uh, classic movies, and there is something special about that 35 millimeter texture, of course. And it seems like it's very important to you as well. Well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, uh, y yes, in certain ways. I start, I've started, I'm, it's still taking a long time. I started a not-for-profit organization in the Czech Republic. I own property in Czech. Yeah. Uh, with uh, four Czech guys, and we purchased the 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter negative uh, processing equipment uh, from Baurendorf Laboratories, which is the, was the main laboratory in Prague. It went out of business right after my first segment of the feature I'm shooting right now had processed my, they went out of my, my 35 millimeter negatives. They were, I was very upset. It was a great laboratory. Yeah. I didn't yeah. want to have to like buy the equipment and it's at my property now. I, I, I went into it. So it's not my equipment. It's, it's for a not for profit organization, but it takes time. We've got it. You know, there's people that have to set it up that, are you know out of work because the laboratory is closed. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as ideally, I for various reasons I would like to continue shooting on 35. I I even you know 16 is great too. I, I I it's the grain pattern of film that I think is very it does something. Um, I'm not against digital. Digital can look great, and there are certain things about digital. And my first two films were greatly helped by having a digital intermediate and then blowing up to the 35 millimeter negative. So I'm, I'm grateful to digital. So I'm not, I'm not like a, a snob against a, a digital, but I do love um, film grain. Uh, so if you can at least capture on film, all the better. But you know, they're going to be great. There have been great films shot digitally and they'll continue to be ones and I, I uh, believe they'll be con continue to be great film shot on on film as well. Hmm. But what is it that makes it so important for you to be there at, at the screenings of of the film? Is it because of? Well, it's, of... it's not actually important for me personally to be at the screenings. In fact, usually while the film plays, I'm not. I'm generally I I don't think I've been in the theater while the film's playing for years. Okay. I I'll go out and get something to eat because I'll have just performed an hour long show and I'll, uh, or I'll, or sometimes if it's a multi, there's a, a venue I tour around with in the U S a lot called the Alamo draft house, which is a very good, uh, situation in the U S Tim league has a great, uh, setup that continues to, to, to expand. And it's a modern theater, but he shows, he has 35 millimeter projection and shows all different kinds of films, and it's it's a private enterprise which has a good artistic heart to it as well. Anyhow, if I go to those, I um, they'll, it'll be a multiplex, so they'll have interesting films playing while my film's playing, and I've seen my film many times, so I can afford to go. Although my films are my first two films, what is it is 72 minutes, and the second film, everything is fine, is 74 minutes, which are relatively short feature films uh so i'll you know have time to go go next door and see a part of some either major release or whatever revival film they have to be happen to be showing and uh so uh yeah i'm generally not in the theater watching sometimes you know i'll come back and i'll look at a reel or sometimes i'll be sitting backstage just because there's nowhere to go for various reasons and i'll I'll watch the film in reverse from the back of the screen, but you know, I, that's more just cause I'm the operation of the live shows and, and what I'm the, the performance and the Q and a that I'm doing after are a way for the film to be distributed. It's just the way that it made sense for me to do it. You know, different people, it makes sense to do things in different ways, and that's just ha what happened to make sense for me to do. 
I enjoy performing the live show. As far as sitting around while the film is playing, you know, if I could just snap and and that time would be over and then I would be doing the Q&A and the, the book signing, that would be fine with me. Cool. But, you know, people have to see the film. And I, I like I say, every once in a while, I'll sit and I'll get caught by it and I'll enjoy looking at the film. But I, that's not the reason that I tour with them. It's not so I can sit and be with the audience. No. I don't, I <laughs> avoid doing that, yeah. But I was just about to say that, that greatly, there's a really one of the Copenhagen's best restaurants is connected to the Cinematheque, so you could probably get a, a great bite to eat there. Or I was, or I was yeah. actually uh, about to suggest, but I pro you probably wouldn't have time to that. But just in the week where you're here in Copenhagen, and I know 2001: A Space Odyssey is one of your favorite movies of all time, that's being screened in a brand new restored 4K version in the biggest cinema in the northern in northern Europe, which is in in Copenhagen. They're screening it three times a day for the next two weeks. Oh. So, uh, yeah. but it, it's probably a little bit longer than your film, so it would be... Uh, yeah, quite a bit longer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's almost three hours, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And it yeah. feels simultaneously shorter because you're so caught up in it and, and longer because it's just like, it's, oh. it's like, uh, yeah. That's yeah, it's amazing. Kubrick is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. We, we were just talking about Kubrick, and um, it, and of course the, the the films that you make have have a sort of Lynchian feel to them as well. Do you have certain inspirations for for the work you do as a director? Well, specifically when I was making What Is It, there were uh, four directors I was thinking about a lot. One of them was Werner Herzog. Uh, and one film in particular, uh, Even Dwarves Started Small. If you see what Even Dwarves Started Small and what is it, you'll you'll be able to see specific influence from that film to, to what is it. But I that was initially what is it was a short film to promote a different f film, which will be part three of the trilogy. It's not the film I'm shooting right now. Not something David Lynch had ag agreed to executive produce years ago. At some point when I get to that, maybe he'll still be the executive producer. I don't know. He was very helpful. And actually, Werner Herzog was very nice to me as well. Two people that I really admire, David Lynch and Werner Herzog, both were very nice to me while uh, making and after making What Is It, which I really appreciate to have people that I admire and then to actually have them be supportive and nice it means so much. But... Uh, Another person I was thinking of a lot, well, yes, Stanley Kubrick, uh, B Luis Bunuel, very much Luis Bunuel. And uh, uh, toward the end of while I was editing, I was thinking uh, about Rainer Werner Fassbinder a, a fair amount, but you can't see that in the film. It had more influence on my next film on uh, Everything is Fine, which Margie Carstensen is the main actress in it, and she... She played a, a lot of the leads in Rainer Werner Fassbinder's films, like uh, Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. She played Petra von Kant, and she was great to work with. Mm. But th those filmmakers were very specifically, while I was working on what is it, were very much on my mind. Mm. But I think it's, it's interesting, especially the fact that you always have this Q&A session as part of, of, of your yeah. show, while you've also talked about how... You, you like to have your art being up there for the interpretation of the audience uh, um, uh, of the audience itself. So what is that interaction that you're seeking in terms of the Q&A? And, you know, not giving away too much. And, well, and it's, a, it's a funny... Um, it's a funny tightrope, in a way, to walk on. Because on one hand, someone like Stanley Kubrick or David Lynch... Many, many great filmmakers are very careful, and I do agree with it, not to talk about what their movies are about. Um, it's funny, though. There's a, re a very recent upload you can see on YouTube of <laughs> Stanley Kubrick talking. I think it's a Japanese uh, interviewer. I was just thinking about of... that. I was just thinking about that when you mentioned, yeah, and explaining yeah, the entire ending. Because the guy... It's, he's interviewing him about about I think it's The Shining, yeah. and he gets Stanley Kubrick to basically say every uh, detail very specifically what the meaning of the end of 2001: The Space Odyssey is. It's amazing, but it's also slightly de de depressing at the same time. In a well, way. Be yeah, because on some uh, there are certain things he says that I would not have known unless I had listened to that interview, and I don't know that I like it better. So it was kind of better when he didn't say it. 
it's but it's funny that it was just this very simple telephone conversation that just recently got released that got him to to say this thing it's it's one of the it's one of the most specific interviews that i've ever heard kubrick do and it was just seemed to have come up within the last several months yeah it's, really it's funny it's but really I, so I, I i attempt to not do that you know i and i as if me making any mistake that Kubrick would may make would be anything but good. I mean, if I any mistake Kubrick made would be probably an improvement on on my own. I'm, that's that's not true. I mean, I'm very <laughs> proud of what is it. It's it's it's, a, it's an interesting film, and I could critique. It's very it's very interesting to watch Stanley Kubrick's first film, which I think that's also become available online. The Fear and Desire. Yeah. You know, the, the, his first. Fee- and you could definitely critique that film. But what's great about the, watching that film is the, um, the, the amount of learning that he had between that film and the first film that was available to see for so many years called Killer's Kiss, which is not one of his all-time greats, but it's still, it's a proficient film. Mm-hmm. Whereas Fear and Desire is, you, you can there are certain things that you could call incompetent in terms of the f- filmmaking and there's certain th- aspects of the the uh, composition of it the the cinematography there are certain things that are even excellent as as even though the film is not one of his best it's still fascinating to see and 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 invigorating because that's you know one of cinema's greatest cinema filmmakers Stanley Kubrick making something that you can critique cinematically. So it's heartening. It's like, if that's his first film and, uh, you know, I, what is it is my first film. So, uh, you know, comparing that to, to Fear and Desire, I feel okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that we could make, we could perhaps expect uh, uh, of, of an absolutely amazing Crispin Glover directed remake of 2001 Space Odyssey in no. a few years. Or a movie on that level. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. That would be a mistake. It, it would be a mistake to make. I mean, you you could make an argument for remaking Clockwork Orange because if you read the book, Alex is a kid, basically. I, I I can't remember his exact age. Eleven, twelve, something like that. He's not very maybe thirteen or fourteen, but he's he's a teenager at most. Yeah. You know, so that's a difference from the book. I wouldn't dare to remake the movie. It's just an incredible. It's a great film. Uh. Yeah, it, it would be a mistake to remake a Kubrick film. Hmm. Even Fear and Desire, just just stay away from, do something else. Yeah, do something original, you know. Yeah. Um, but- I, I'm not even against remakes. I think remakes are okay. Because whenever people argue against remakes, I think about, uh, you know, The Wizard of Oz with uh, Judy Garland was a remake yeah. of a silent film that was directed by the author of the book, by L. Frank Baum, directed a silent version of Wizard of Oz. And it's it's not a particularly good film. It's it's interesting novelty, but Wizard of Oz uh, and the, the performance by Judy Garland and the Technicolor and the production design, it's it's a great movie. Yeah. Uh, and that's a remake, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've never been really that much against the concept of remakes either, because, but I think what you're saying is right. The way to go about them is to take those movies that at the core of them have an interesting notion, interesting idea, but that hasn't really been truly realized to its potential. And then then take that idea and try and remake it into something more valuable. Instead of taking, as they usually do, take movies that are masterpieces or great movies already. That's a bad idea, yeah. I, I, you've got to really have something extra special that you're going to do i i would that i would not dare no i don't think i hope i don't ever do that no but i'd much rather fail at my original idea than try to better something that was already great and fail at that (laughs) hopefully i don't fail at my own idea either that's that's better yeah (laughs) are there certain perceptions of the movies that have surprised you in terms of specific countries, specific experiences. I mean, like you said, you've been to Denmark well, once before. Is it? Just, just um, the only thing I've noticed is the way for the live shows, how certain certain countries are much quieter. Okay. Than, U.S. is actually very good in terms of when you do a show, it's a, a live show. It actually is nice when an audience is loud. It makes you feel good as a as a performer. Um, 
because you can, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a better audience and it doesn't necessarily mean they're perceiving it better. It just feels easier when you're performing, if there's laughter or what have you. But um, it, like I say, it doesn't matter. Japan, I performed in Japan and the audience, you, it is dead silent, like so silent. Like they, it seems like they would feel rude if they like tittered or something. Hmm. You, it's just so quiet. And then, and, but then after the show, it's like they're just so enthusiastic and you can tell that they were really concentrating and thinking about it. So it's not, it's not actually how much people are enjoying the show. It's harder though as a live performer. And I found that in Germany as well. Germany was very quiet. Copenhagen, as I recall, was, was not quiet like Germany. Copen, Copenhagen, as I recall, was actually a pretty interactive audience. But it's been, oh, I had a technical problem there before. So I was more concentrated about that. But the audience was very good. Okay, yeah. We, we, we like to be expressive and loud. It seemed like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've said before that you felt it was also important for you in terms of, of these projects to showcase the viability of using actors with Down syndrome. How, how come that particular factor was something that was very important to you? Well, there were there were a lot of different reasons for that. But uh, for what, for one thing, it was because what is it originally was a short film. It was promoting something. It was to promote something that was in the film I've still not made, which will be part three. It is mine is the title of part three of the uh, trilogy. Hmm. That was written way back in 1996. And that was the original film I was planning to make. And like what is it, most of the cast is to be played by actors with Down syndrome. But I made, I, I made what, started to make what is it as a short film to promote this as being a viable idea because I, I went, when David Lynch had agreed to executive produce It Is Mine for me to direct, and I had certain name actors that were interested to be in the film, I went to one of the larger so-called independent companies in Los Angeles or companies that funded so-called independent films in the 90s, which is much, there's not really an so-called independent thing going on the way there was in the 90s. There are ind so-called independent films being made, and in certain ways there's some very good stuff going on, but it's it's a different mechanism, so to speak. Or I, I actually think there are positive things happening, but it's, it's different. Anyhow, uh, I had, a, they were interested and I had a number of meetings and conversations with them, but ultimately they let me know that they were concerned about funding a film wherein a majority of the characters were to be played by actors with Down syndrome. Hmm. So it was determined that I should make a short screenplay or a short film that would promote this as being a viable idea. But what happened was I then I, I wrote what is it as a 20-something page screenplay and I decided I'll make all of the characters be played by actors with Down syndrome. Because I wanted to drive that point home. I wanted to show this is viable. Mm. It shouldn't be a problem to fund. And then when I, I cut that together, I recognized that what that company was actually concerned about, it was not the viability of a majority of the characters to be played by actors with Down syndrome, it was the concept. It was the concept of having a majority of the characters being played by actors with Down syndrome wherein those characters do not necessarily have Down syndrome. Mm. That was the part that became essentially taboo because then a corporation would be concerned with something like people asking questions like, why are you doing this? Are you making fun of these people? Are you taking advantage of these people? You know, none of, none of those things did I have any interest in, but that's what the corporations were concerned that they could get questioned. And then I recognized corporations are concerned about being questioned about anything. Hmm. For any real question, corporations don't want. 
and and it, I can go into a kind of a long political diatribe about that, but it's essentially true. Corporations are in control of how how uh, in the United States how how media is run, how education is run, and how the government is run. They fund all of those things. You know, the U.S. they call it a do- democracy. It's not. It's the, the it's it's completely corrupted, and the politicians are given donations by corporations, and then they do the biddings of the corporations. I mean, and and, it, and of course that's a corruptness that needs to be gotten rid of, and people talk about it, but it's a very difficult thing to to actually get done. But but then the same thing happens in education, and the same thing happens in media. So it's all run essentially by corporate interests. So corporate interests then have no, there's no value for a corporation to uh, fund something that's going to be not good for their own interest or distribute something that's not good for their own interest. So they'll fund things that don't make people question anything. Hmm. Because if people question something, they'll just as likely question the viability of corporations and get rid of that possibility. Because in the 1700s, corporations in the United States did not, they had to, they had to make a, um, some kind of charter that proved that they were doing something good for the population, which was letting them exist. Because if you think about it, the corporation can't exist if the population doesn't support it. So it makes sense that a corporation should be doing something good for the culture. But as it is now through various, you know, Century through the centuries, through 1800s and 1900s, bribes were obviously made to politicians, and corporations got the it to the point where now they're considered people legally in the United States, which is absurd. Hmm. But uh, anyhow, so I recognized I wasn't thinking about every single one of those things, but I did recognize that I had something that was taboo in the film. And that corporate interests were not going to want to to distribute or fund it. And this was actually an important concept. And so I knew I could self-distribute it by by touring with my shows. So I might as well go into these territories that corporations would not feel comfortable with and just make that the message hmm. or, or or put the it in the 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 story within the embodiment of things that essentially made people uncomfortable hmm. corporations would never want to to touch and uh, and because and, and because i truly went to that area that's why it still is actually viable because it's actually gotten more that way rather than less that way since 1996 hmm. As you say, with the corporations, also with, you know, to the degree that the dark side of Hollywood is really being shined a light upon in the last year or so, you know, it, it must be even more gratifying to be outside and not embroiled in that corporate studio system. You know? Well, I mean, I am. I am embroiled in it. I, uh, that's how I've made my living. I, I mean, for the, for the most part, I haven't worked in, in studio films, but I have. I've, I've been in studio films. Uh, there's no way at this point in time since, I don't know, the 1980s to have a career in the film entertainment world in the United States and not be involved in propaganda. If you're acting or directing or writing or producing films in the corporately funded and distributed film system, you are actively partaking in propaganda, in the U.S. propaganda system. That is just how it works. There are people, of course, that fight against it subversively on some level here and there, and I applaud that. And they, sometimes there are very good films made within the corporate system. And I do think because this is starting to, there's an under, I'm writing a book about this right now. I've, I've got a, been working on it for years. I'm over 500 or 450 pages on it. I've got a, I, I, I've, I've just started kind of attempting to edit it. Cool. Uh, but, uh, but I I see that it's like when I even even just in the last couple of years I see very positive things happening just the way people are talking about it on the internet it's starting to break apart which is a very good thing it's part of why I wanted to write the book 
is because when I first started writing it, I wasn't even seeing it start to break apart. Now I'm seeing it start to actually, people are recognizing this. And like I say, I'm happy about it because I've been talking about this and thinking about this since before 1996. Mm -hmm. So it's a long time. Uh, so, I mean, and even though people are thinking about it, there still is a stronghold that needs to be dealt with properly and how that will happen, uh, how, how, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know what, what the next things that will happen are, but I do think there are interesting things going on. Looking forward to reading that book, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got to finish that soon. Yeah. I love to wind the clock a little bit back in here because uh, what with your father being an actor and I vividly remember him him from Diamonds Are Forever, right. which I think is yeah. a very underrated Bond film. He's he's a great henchman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what was he uh, was he part of the reason that you got into acting in in the first place? Yeah. Well, yes, in 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 different ways than you might think. I was never I was never pushed into it by my parents. My mother also. Uh, retired as a dancer and actress when I was born. So I, I had grown up with both of my parents being involved in the, in the acting entertainment industry, essentially. Uh, but, you know, it, my mother retired when I was born, and, and my parents uh, were married. My mother died a couple of years ago now. Uh, my parents were married for 55 years when she died. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I had grown up around that, um, business essentially. And, and it, my father was never super famous or, or super wealthy. Uh, but you know, he, it was a, a, a good, it was a solid middle class uh, living, which is fine. I, I. I'm, I'm actually very grateful that I was neither re raised neither poor because that would just that would not be fun, nor wealthy because when you're middle class you kind of know you've got to do something. Like I knew I couldn't stay living at my parents' house. I had to get out and have some kind of job. They couldn't support me, so uh, I at a relatively young age started recognizing that. I felt it was something I could do. It wasn't, you know, if I had not grown up in that situation, I I don't think it was my natural thing I would have done. I'm, it's not like I'm a natural born actor, but I was able to figure it out, so to speak. And I did go to acting class, professional acting class. My father teaches acting, but I never, uh, formally studied with my father, but I did formally study in other acting schools, and uh, which was valuable for me. Hmm. And uh, so it was. It, it it actually was a a career choice. It was a, a choice that I made at a relatively young age. Even before, it's really that when I really actually got very interested in it, though more than just as kind of a thing I felt I could do was when I was 16 and I started to drive and go to the the revival houses that were popular in Los Angeles in 1980, I was 16, and they were showing old films from the, the 70s and uh, 60s, 50s, well, 20s, 30s, but uh, which was an interesting f time for film. There was a lot of questioning going on at that time in film, which when I started acting in my... Well, I started acting 13, 14, but I didn't work a lot until I turned 18 and the child labor laws worked in my advantage and I started working in, in feature films. But I was looking around, that was 1982, and I was thinking, where are these kind of questions that I was enjoying watching in these movie theaters? And I recognize now, in retrospect, it was right around that time that corporate interests were starting to pull back on the amounts of questioning that was going on with people like Stan, Stanley Kubrick or uh, Fassbinder or Herzog or, well, yeah, Bunuel, Bunuel's last film, I believe, was 1982. 
Hmm. So there was something that definitely happened around that time. But there are, like I say, there are people that those filmmakers went on to continue making films that that, that question and. Uh, and there are new filmmakers that are able to do it here and there as well, which I applaud. It's difficult to pull off. Hmm. And also, we've, we've talked so much about artistry. And speaking of that, one of the biggest artists, of course, of, of the modern age is Andy Warhol. And I think you, were, you delivered a great performance as him and Oliver Stone's The Doors. That must have been interesting, but also was it a, a sort of daunting task as well? Play such a legend. I, I, the reason that happened was I had met Andy Warhol at... Uh, Madonna and Sean Penn's wedding. I talked to him a little bit. Wow! And then, I, and then I, after I talked to him, I kind of stood back and and watched him and how he held himself and moved. And I thought he would be an interesting person to play. So I was thinking, I was watching him, thinking that. And there was a couple of years later, I had met Oliver Stone on a, just a general meeting for Platoon. I didn't read or anything. It was just, a, and I had a nice meeting. We talked for a while, but. I'm, I wasn't in the movie or anything, but it was just a nice general meeting. Uh, and and then I had heard that there was an uh, Andy Warhol role in the Doors movie that he was directing. So I said to my agents to get some kind of meeting with him or something. And so I, I did read for that and I, I got the part. You know, I actually, I don't really, I have a very different kind of nose than Andy Warhol. So uh, there was a, a nose made, but his nose kind of like curves up and I have a bump in my nose. So it actually had to be like a very large prosthetic <laughs> to kind of get that shape. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it is difficult anytime. I, I have a hard time watching most um, bio, biographical films of famous actors or singers because Part of the reason that an actor is famous and a singer generally, it's not just their singing voice, but their, the way they look, how they are. So it's, it's virtually impossible for an actor to replicate that. Hmm. I, it, it, I, so it's always kind of distracting. I generally avoid watching those, those films for that reason. In fact, I, I, I think it's essentially it's an illegal film to see but there's that film about Karen Carpenter called Superstar that was made with Barbie dolls. And the, the director works, uh, Todd Haynes is, I think, his name. Ah. He did other big films. Yeah. But it was his first film, and he directed it with Barbie dolls. Uh, and it's about Karen. It's, but it sounds like it's going to be funny, but it's a serious film. Okay. And, and it's uh, like uh, about her dealing with anorexia and how she dies. But because there's not that interface of the of an actual actor's face and you hear her actual voice and then the voices that voice over the 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 characters as the dolls are nondescript enough you actually feel more like you're watching Karen Carpenter and then he didn't have the rights to the songs and I, the brother was who who had written the songs was kind of written almost as the structural antagonist, whether that's true or not, I don't know in real life, but that's how it is in the, the movie, and it's effective. It's an effective movie. So he, of course, I'm sure wasn't happy about it, and he sued, and you, it's not... I think you can, like, sometimes see... It, it often gets probably taken down on YouTube, but I think you can see it. It's actually a very well-made film, but it doesn't have that aspect of the interference of an actor's face. So yes, I, I was aware of that when uh, when playing Andy Warhol. But the fact that I'd met him and I, I felt like I could think about that, I I felt like there was something to to give for it. Yeah, but but that's interesting though because it, 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 you you feel oftentimes in Hollywood the the performances that are really celebrated are when they when actors perform act, uh, play actors or actresses from you know from the olden days when they're when they're good at replicating that it, it is, it's a weird sort of pat on the back of their own you know history in a way oh, yeah yeah i haven't really thought about that but maybe so yeah you've also said before that just because you're an artist doesn't mean that you can't be pragmatic uh, and I guess that's also probably some of the reasoning behind some of the films you do that you can do some of these uh, projects in order to to be able to do and fund and do these passion projects that you have the more artistic projects. Yeah, like. well, 
there were different stages of how those th things kind of came about. You know, as a teenager, when I first started acting, before I was in acting class, when it first came into my head as a 11, 12 years old, I thought, well, I guess it would be neat to be in a commercial or on television or in a movie. I didn't know. I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about it as art. It was once I started seeing films while I was studying acting in the movie theaters that were older revival house films that I was recognizing art in the films. I'd always been interested in art. Like I liked Hieronymus Bosch and Salvador Dali and various painters. I liked art, but I didn't necessarily equate cinema as art. I'd grown up watching television more. I didn't go see the films that my father, I didn't see Chinatown until I was an adult. I didn't go see R-rated films when I was a kid. So I saw some films, but it wasn't like I was an avid go film goer until I got to be like 16 and going to see the Revival House films. Hmm. Uh, so that's when I started getting very interested in the art of film and even and filmmaking. I mean, I, I actually already had an uh, a Super 8 camera and made films when I was 13, 14. So I guess I was always interested in it in some way, but I, I really was equating it with art by the time I was 16. Okay. And then, um, and then, but you know, but again, it was like I was uh, I I I did need to make a living, so I couldn't just. I had to accept work that I got. I couldn't be overly selective about things. So I, and I, on some level, I still can't. It's like, but what happened was. I was more selective about it. After Back to the Future came out, I had questions about some of what was being said in that film, and I felt like I should be more selective. And the first film I acted in after that film came out was River's Edge, hmm. which is a I am proud of River's Edge. You know, it was like I, I acted, there were certain directors that were interesting that I worked with in the 80s and, and 90s, but the films were not necessarily great films. They didn't necessarily make that much money. And it was not necessarily that great for my acting career. And it was in 90, um, 1998 when Stephen C. Stewart, who's the main actor and who'd written this Everything is Fine, he had a severe case of cerebral palsy. He, uh, one of his lungs collapsed. Cerebral palsy is not degenerative stays the same way that somebody is, but he was getting older and he was choking on his own saliva and he got pneumonia. And it became apparent if we didn't shoot something soon, we, we may never get to shoot anything at all. And it was right at that time that the first Charlie's Angels film was coming to me. Mm. And so uh, I recognized with the money that I would make, could make from that film, I could fund the production of the Steve, Steve's film, which I did. Just the production. It was mainly the main cost was really shooting the sets that were built for it, which are be very beautiful sets. I co-directed it with David Brothers, who who built. He has he really knows what he's doing with building sets, hmm. and uh, he built the sets in the film, which was a great part of the character of the film. Yeah. And, and uh, so, but then then Charlie's Angels did well financially, which was good for me career wise. And I recognize, and I got offered Willard, and it, I recognized that it was it was better for me if I wanted to be funding, if I wanted to do movies that I was really interested in, making my own films. It was better for me to fund my own films with money that I made as a corporate actor, and to think of acting as a as a craft as opposed to being my art and shift my art into my filmmaking. Um, so I was less, I, I became, I, I, I started acting in things starting after, around the year 2000, that five, ten years before I would have not done. Because hmm. there, there is a different way of going about an acting career. I, which I, uh, you know, I I recommend if somebody wants to be thinking of their art as acting, 
it is important to be, I think, so selective of certain kinds of stuff. Uh, but, and, but I decided to not do that and to act in things that I could make money in order to fund my own films. It's arguable that I, in the long run, would make more money if I was more selective about my acting roles and and would escalate in my acting career and be known as a selective kind of excellent actor. But for various reasons, it just made more sense for me to, to fund my, my films. So hopefully there are some things that are, that are okay, but I mean, I know the difference. I, I can tell the difference of what happens once you select things in, a, in that different fashion. Mm. But I mean, I, I, I loved your performance and I loved your character in the Charlie's Angels films. I mean, I don't remember yeah. that much about them except that. <laughs> well, yeah, I was I was happy with it. But it, but it's like um, I, I made good uh, a good salary on the second Charlie's Angels film. It is arguable that it would have been more selective to not do the second Charlie's Angels film. But the second Charlie's Angels film definitely helped me pay to finish both What Is It and Everything Is Fine. Hmm. Uh, not just that, but I, I did a number. I, that year I did that film. I did Willard, Charlie's Angels, and um, a, a kid's movie called Like Mike. And, and those were all studio films. That still to this date is my best financial year I've had. I took all of that money and I, I bought the property in check, which is where I now have 18,000 square feet of former horse stables for the property that is, is filled with sets for the film that I'm editing right now. And I plan to continue to use those sets for other productions. Hmm. And now that you just mentioned the Czech Republic, I, I, I feel like I have to ask, because I also really enjoyed your performance in The People vs. Larry Flint, uh, which, of course, was made by yeah. Milos Forman, who, who recently passed away. Did you, did you have any special memories about working well, with yeah, him? Yeah, he, he was actually another filmmaker that was very nice. He, he um, It was funny, because when I was working on People vs. Larry Flint, was I had just started shooting What Is It? Well, no, that's not quite right. I had started shooting it as an expanded film. I had quite long hair. And Milos Forman, um, at one point there was discussion because I I'd sh already started shooting with the long hair for What Is It? And I was cast with the long hair in People vs. Larry Flynn. It was a 70s film, so it was appropriate. But it goes into the 80s. And at one point, Milos Furman was wanting me to get an 80s haircut, but it actually turned out that there was uh, another shot that had to be shot after we shot the 80s stuff where my hair was long again. So I was going to have to wear a wig one way or another, either cut my hair and wear a long wig again. It made more sense just to put the wig on for the 80s sequence, which was lucky because after I shot that, then I went back and shot more for What Is It? But Milos Furman one morning came up to me and he was like being really friendly good morning good morning Crispin how are you it's so good to see you do you want something what and he was he was being really nice and I he said do you know why I'm being so nice to you and I, I said no he said because I've heard you're making a movie and I want to be in it <laughs> he, he had a he had a good sense of humor he was very funny uh he, I, 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 and I told him most of the actors in the film had Down syndrome, so he started questioning me about that. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty certain had I pressed on it, I, I'm sure he would have acted in it. He was sincere, actually. He actually did want to be in it. Um, but I, I did contact him uh, when I was in New York because I, I, I think he was living in New York at the time. And uh, he contacted me. I invited him to see the film. I told him this is the film I was working on. And he was very nice. And uh, he contacted me back and, and supportive. And I re recognize that the filmmakers that have been supportive are, are filmmakers like Herzog, 
like Lynch, like Milos Forman, and actually John Waters was very nice. The, all of these filmmakers are people that they made their own movies. Like it took a lot to do it themselves. They physically made them. It wasn't something where they got funding. Uh, maybe, me, I mean, Milos Forman, it's a different thing in Czech, but still he was, he was formulating those films. Those four filmmakers all were very nice and supportive to, to, to me and, and just had a good feeling about those things. Mm. Another filmmaker that's obviously played a, a part in your career is Robert Zemeckis, and I'd love to hear because I think I think actually Beowulf is sort of an underrated little gem. And of course, it, yeah. it came out a few years before Avatar and actually started spearheading the 3D revolution before Avatar even came out. Uh, well, I there are interesting things about that film. It, it was co-written uh, by um, Roger Avery and uh, Neil Gaiman. And, uh, of course, I'm working on Neil Gaiman's American Gods right now, which he is the executive producer of it. And that's a big part of why I, I, I did it, because I'd met him while doing uh, um, uh, Grendel for um, Beowulf. And I could, I, he was a great guy, and, and he was a great writer. I wasn't as familiar with him as a, a, a novelist. I knew he was a... Uh, a great novelist. Uh, I only actually just read American Gods, which is an excellent piece of writing. Mm -hmm. I'm, very, I'm very glad. I, you know, I want them to to finish the book uh, for the series. But um, and then Roger Avery, I also just worked with last year. I shot a feature film that he directed, uh, and he wrote. And uh, that was a great experience as well. So, so uh, I've had multiple good things happen from, from being, being in Beowulf. And it was, you know, there was the lawsuit that had happened for Back to the Future. So it was nice to work. I had never expected I'd work with Robert Zemeckis again. And part of how that happened was because of Roger Avery. Roger Avery was originally supposed to direct Beowulf. And then Zemeckis bought, bought the... Um, the screenplay for himself to direct from Roger Avery. Hmm. Um, and so Roger Avery, Zemeckis had said he would cast people that, that Roger Avery and Neil Gaiman had talked about playing the roles. And I happened to be one of those people. So it was an interesting thing that happened. And, and it was helpful because that, that whole uh, thing with back to the future sequel and the lawsuit was still is, uh, uncomfortable because people still to this day believe that I was in the, the the sequels and it wasn't me, it was somebody in prosthetics to make them up to look like me in order to fool people into believing I was in the film, which I'm not. Hmm. Well, there's a very small amount of footage of me, but it's mostly a, a different actor in prosthetics. Very strange thing. And yes, illegal. It was illegal for them to do it before my lawsuit, but my lawsuit was precedent setting in the fact that it showed how illegal something like that is. Hmm. But it never became like a talking point between you and Simicus by no. doing the shooting with Beowulf. I purposely avoided, I never made, I read the How to Be a Gentleman. <laughs> said, do not bring up sore subjects. So I, I never brought it up and he didn't either. And and then I, I enjoyed playing Grendel. I mean, the thing you, the thing you could critique about the, the film is the, um, is the technology there, that that uh, the uncanny eye quality. It's, I think it was bettered by, um, you know, the filmmaker that did Avatar. The technology is better now. Mm. But I, I understood the. There were interesting things that I think most people don't know about the technology, like, um, you know, Anthony Hopkins played my father. Angelina Jolie played my mother. And Ray Winstone, of course, played um, Beowulf. But, you know, I think when people think of that technology, they, they think of like the little camera in front of somebody's face and somebody alone. But you're, when we shot that, it was in what they called a volume, it was a stage with all cameras all around you. So everybody was in a close up and a wide shot at the same time which is different from when you're shooting with a, a camera, whereas you have a master, but usually when you're doing your close, the other person's off camera, and then you do the reverse. So you're not on camera at the same time that you're doing off camera. It's 
And it's not that you, you know, good actors want to do good work for the person off camera, but there's a somehow there's always a different dynamic than when you're actually on camera. Hmm. And and the fact that the that technology let the actors be both in the master and on camera at the same time was I, I, that aspect of it was actually very interesting in working with those excellent actors. Hmm. But, that was good. But can you imagine that filmmaking would some point reach a, a spot where that's how movies are predominantly made because it's easier timing wise, budget wise to. Oh, to I, then... I, I don't think that's true. Uh, it's arguable that shooting a 35 millimeter negative film is less expensive than shooting a digital film. In fact, that's part of why I shoot on 35. It sounds counterintuitive, but you know, if you're using a high quality Alexa or um, red camera, if you buy the camera, it's something like 60 or I can't remember 60 to $80,000 for the body then you've, you're going to be spending a large amount of money for the lenses. Uh, you know, you're going to go over $100,000 just for that equipment if you're buying it. If you're renting it and it's for a month, you're still going to be spending a lot of money. But you can buy a 35 millimeter camera body now for very little money. Hmm. So, you, you, yes, you have the costs and the, the kind of pain of dealing with film, but it's film. Um, Still, though, if you calculate that out, it's also it's easier to work with a um, film camera in terms of, well, I like I don't have a video village. Most filmmakers, even when they're shooting with 35 or 16, will have a video village. But that's when I first started acting in film, that's that wasn't normal and, and it isn't necessary. And I actually don't think it's good to do that. So just having a camera, you can have a DP that ideally also is able to gaff and you have other people that are uh, helping with certain things. You can minimize your crew much more readily with uh, film than with, um, with the electronics. You've got to have, if you're setting up the video, you, I mean, you have to have the video village if you're shooting digital. And so that that takes a crew, and then the the ca it it's more stuff. So it's arguably more expensive. I mean, you can shoot with an iPhone, and that doesn't cost anything. But you know, and it's, it's arguable that you you could make an interesting movie with an iPhone, but there are limits to that as well. So I, it's more about the argument of high end digital versus high end film, or not high end film, even low end film. I think has arguably a higher production value than high-end digital. Hmm. So why not shoot what many people regard as the as the uh, the best quality if it's if it, when it's arguably probably less expensive than shooting with a, a digital camera. Mm. Also, as a Dane, because of course, Beowulf takes place in Denmark, in uh, in old times. It's it's based on an old uh, one of the Beowulf. old. Yeah, Beowulf. Yeah, it oh, takes place. Okay. In, yeah, yeah. It, it's a very so very it takes old. Place in Denmark. Yeah, it's an old piece of of Danish folklore. Oh, uh, that makes uh, sense. Yeah. I didn't realize somehow I wasn't thinking that, but of course it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. but but the funny thing is that it, like many international movies that are made that take place in Denmark, it's showed as a beautiful landscapes with huge mountains you know very which is you know very epic very very uh, very nor northern but denmark is such a flat country the tallest point of denmark is like 400 feet so all okay. those epic sceneries are just like yeah. even in the danish girl a fairly recent movie they were having picnic in nature and there are mountains and stuff okay and we don't have a single mountain so yeah it's it's, it's funny that that perception yeah. of something uh, versus the reality well, i also think i also think it's just not not even perception. I, I think it's usually just whatever the money that's happened for corporate production. You know, like I, I shot. I have a film that just was uh, premiered in um, at the Los Angeles Film Festival this last week called "We've Always Lived in the Castle," and it it was based on a book written by Shirley Jackson in 1962 that was supposed to take place in like upstate New York or the East 
east upper upper east coast but we shot it in ireland because it was less expensive mm. to shoot in ireland than the us so it usually just has to do with that and they they're, they're not i think usually the reason people are shooting somewhere has nothing to do with trying to be authentic <laughs> and it's more how it if it can play for what the material is and I mean, it depends on the filmmaker, of course, but generally I think that's what happens. I don't think they're worried if somewhere does or doesn't have mountains or, you know, no. I think they're usually not trying to replicate. I mean, I, of course, that happens like if you you see a film that's set in L.A. and like somebody will be it, driving in a car in a part that would take 40 minutes to get to in the next shot. There, You know, to, know it if you're in the place, but most people don't don't know the difference no <laughs> and then also one of my favorite performances of yours is just it's just a small part in this in a crazy comedy show called drunken history which i think is one of the best yeah. concepts of modern television history i think it's a very good concept as well the part of the reason i did it well for one thing i i do know john john c Riley, who's an excellent actor and and i'm friendly with him so it was it was i, I knew he would be involved in i wasn't familiar with it but i knew he'd be involved in something that was of quality And, uh, then, uh, but I, I did like the concept because to me, again, having to do with propaganda, what we call history, sober history is like, I've read, you know, interviews that I've done with somebody that, you know, somebody's I've sat down with and they're nice and whatever and i read the interview and it has virtually nothing to do with what i talked about or what i said or and it's that what this thing that they wanted to write and and people will believe that and that's contemporary and i was with the person in the room so we have all of these histories that were written hundreds of years ago maybe the person was never there it's just people talking about things and we believe that to be the truth But I, I actually think they get as to as much truth in a drunk history retelling as as a sober history because they're getting to a I don't know like Werner Herzog has that thing he says the ecstatic truth there's a poetry to a truth which is actually truer than probably the tr the so-called truth and uh, I think there's something to be said for that so I, I liked that concept of the of of drunk history they're kind of mean like they make them do it over and <laughs> over they keep getting them drunk and just to the point where like the per person can really only get to the essential things and uh, it's an interesting it's actually an interesting artistic exercise <laughs> I, i i i do like what they've done with that yeah It reminds me of a, of a Danish, old Danish saying, which is, the truth shall be heard from the drunks and the children. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's where you get the undiluted truth. That, yeah, uh, yeah, that's, so, uh, yeah I, I agree. Yeah, but I've always wanted to ask someone who's appeared in that show if it's difficult that balancing that between matching the very specific timing of the drunk recording and then actually being able to emote and act as an actor. No, they give you, they give you the recording and... Uh, you know it beforehand and I just voiced my own voice along with it even though I knew they'd use the uh, fellow's voice but but also another project that I, I guess you haven't been asked about that much I don't think it's a particularly good movie but I think you're very compelling in it and that's a epic movie which I guess was also <laughs> you know part yeah of the I, you know the funny thing is I've never seen it no. Uh, I no I I I I saw parts maybe i think i might have seen my whole part of it when i did uh, i had to do you know adr uh, voice replacement i think i saw my whole thing we had shot some other stuff that they cut out which i wish they had left in it was actually kind of interesting i thought but you know it got terrible reviews and and at this point in time i just it's like unless there's a premiere or something And there's a reason for me to go to it. I generally don't. I feel kind of bad about it, but I mean, 
I like doing the films. I, I, I always want to do my best job I can possibly do. But the, I don't know. I don't. I don't really care about seeing myself in them anymore, unless, like I say, there's a, like even like I'm very happy to be working on American Gods right now. Mm. And I saw the uh, premiere episode a number of times. Cause the, not the premiere, the first episode, because they had a number of events. I'm not even in the first episode. But I saw it a number of times just because there was an event and it was fun and I want to support the thing and I'm glad to be doing the Neil Gaiman book. But I've not actually seen my own episode of it. I saw some of the clips and I felt great about it. I, I, it was beautifully written. Uh, that, was, that was one of the best written scenes I've ever had uh, the pleasure of doing. It was beautiful writing. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm enjoying doing the show. But I, I maybe at, at some point when we finish the whole thing, I'll like binge watch it, like I'll, most people I think are doing now with these long things that are based on on uh, books. So um, uh, yeah, I, I then they didn't have a premiere, or at least I, if they did, I, I don't think they had a premiere. If they did, I wasn't at it. I wasn't invited to it, or I was out of town. I don't remember now. Mm. But uh, yeah, so I've never. I've never actually seen it, but I did see my own part. It was it was fine. I I had a good time playing that yeah. part. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it must have been fun to sort of parody. Of course, it's a classic courage, but to parody Johnny Depp in a way who you've of well, course played I, with several I, I, times. Wasn't, you know, the thing was was when I saw I I had not seen. I've worked I've, I've worked with him several times. Uh, I've known him for a long, long time when he first started acting. The first day he got his first job was the first day I met. Johnny Depp, so like 1982 or three or whatever year it was, wow. so a long time ago. But uh, I saw so I hadn't seen his performance, but I, when I found out I was going to do it, I felt like I better watch this to see if there was something to so-called parody. I didn't see anything to parody. I thought he did a good job, and uh, he he had a good character to play. I didn't feel like it would be right to make fun of it. I didn't think there was anything particularly to make fun of. So it was just more kind of, I mean, they put me in the outfit that was similar to the Tim Burton uh, aesthetic that had been put in into that film. But um, on some level, I, I was, there was one sequence that was cut out that I was trying to get more of what um, Gene Wilder had done, which of course was a, a, a great performance, uh, but on, on some level it was just kind of also just playing it. I mean, there were, I guess there were aspects, but not really. I, it's hard to d describe. It was just more the fun of playing the character, actually. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's a very like artistic, actually alternative version of the film on the DVD. I remember where they actually somebody spent a lot of time synchronizing fart sounds to specific movements in the film. So I remember really? like there's this very beautiful. This is scene. on the DVD extra. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's like there's a scene where you appear at the first time in the movie dancing on stage, and every little movement you make is very carefully synchronized with these fart sounds. Oh. It's almost beautiful. You should almost listen to that. Was it done by the filmmakers? I think so. I, I, I guess so. It's uh... They had done a different film, which I'd seen. What was it called? That was actually, it had a slightly surreal aspect to it. And I remember when I met with them, I'd seen the film. I said, have, I'd asked them if they'd seen certain Bunuel films. Because it almost, you know, the uh, if you've seen um, Bunuel's um what is it called? Uh, Phantom of Liberty. Mm -hmm. It has hu humor. In fact, Bunuel, when he wrote about it, used the term gags for a lot of his sequences. They are actually strangely dark, weird, well, surrealistically, literally, capital S, surrealistically humorous. But it's a different kind of humor than laugh out loud humor, necessarily. But, but there were aspects of one of their other films, I can't remember what it was, and I asked them if they were familiar with uh, Phantom of Liberty or Bunuel's films, and they weren't at all, so. <laughs> but uh, I think they're, they're probably more going for the, the joke, 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 which is not what Bunuel would do. But sometimes 
if somebody's going for a joke, it can actually get into an odd territory that is almost dreamlike. It is almost surreal with a capital S. Mm. That, that's what I think works in, in, in the best spoofs, like like the Naked Gun films. So you have that central character, Frank Treppen, who's the straight man. The straight man in this surreal universe, and that contrast. I haven't seen that film, but I, oh, but you should. I, I saw him in, well, he was in Airplane, right? Or yeah, one of those. Yeah. Oh, yeah, surely you can't be serious. I am serious, but don't right, call me right. surely. Yes. Yeah. I, I knew that he did the Naked Gun movies, but I don't think I saw those. I saw the Airplane movies. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's. They're all kind of in the same train of uh, the same of, bracket of uh, films, yeah. yeah. Something, yeah. yeah. It's the same genre of style of humor. Yeah, and then, but then finally, Chris, because I think you've played so many amazing characters. We've already delved into so many of them, and so many that we haven't really mentioned. You, all, you briefly mentioned Willard, who I also think is a great character and a great film. And a lot of these characters have been characterized, of course, as slightly off and. And oddball and, and and weird and reading interviews, researching interviews with you across many years. That's often words that have also been uh, characterized with with you as well. But there's also been a clear uh, idea when reading these interviews that you're aware of this notion that that that's how you're often depicted as as a person. So how, where do you think that that stems from? Is that from your choice of roles, performances, or and well, it's it's a number of things. You know, I'm writing a, the the book right now about propaganda, and I I'll go into some more detail about things I've never really talked about because I've got to talk about them in a specific way that it's better to write it down rather than than talk about it out loud. But there are things that of I did earlier in my career that I think people mix up with me as kind of the characters that I've played as being. So I think, I think people automatically think of me. I mean, I, I'm, 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 uh, eccentric in terms of my interests in arts. I have, I have an eccentric uh, or an admiration for eccentric art, so to speak. In terms of me as a human being, I mean, it's hard to judge yourself. I I actually don't think I'm that eccentric in my life. I mean, I've, I live the life of a, an actor and you know filmmaker, etc. So that that on its own is a more unusual lifestyle. So that automatically, but in terms of me compared to I don't know many actors. In the film industry, I'm probably considered more eccentric. I don't know that I actually am. Maybe, but maybe not too. I, I I might actually be less eccentric than many people that aren't considered eccentric. But 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 part of it is also, like I said, in the year 2000 particularly, I changed the films that I was choosing to do to really be funding my own films, which is different from choosing parts to push the boundaries of your acting ability. Mm. Yeah. And so many of the films that I've done are films that I've been offered, which does not necessarily push those boundaries away from sometimes what actors will do and I, I i commend it when they do it is they'll keep pushing to find characters that are differentiated from a previous character that they played so that they can extend their acting ability and that is a good thing for an actor to do i haven't necessarily done that because I, I, in the year 2000, particularly, I started really concentrating on just bringing money in to continue doing my, my projects. So that can reinforce playing a certain kind of character rather than saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait and wait and wait until I get this kind of thing that's very different from what I previously did. And, and, and But also, I always was even as a young actor in my teens, interested in playing 
more odd or unusual characters. I never had a, uh, a resili- I never did not want to play those characters. But, I, I mean, there's something to be said. Like the character I played in River's Edge, if you looked at the original script, it was not necessarily that eccentric of a character. The way that I played it, perhaps, was more eccentric than what the what the the character was was written as. And there could be something to be said for me playing characters that are not written from page one as eccentric, but by the fact that I've been choosing to fund my films and take parts that are coming in, most of the characters that I'm offered tend toward being a reflection of characters that I've played in one way or another. I try to find the various boundaries or elements out of that character, but they often have that element to them. And I haven't really fought it. It's Hmm. like I, because I, I can do it, and I and so and I actually can enjoy doing that. But like I said, if I were to be concentrating on expanding myself only as an actor and not as a filmmaker, that would be what I would be doing. I would say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to wait until there's a part that does that. But at that point, I could be, you know, trying to do my film, and then I have bills coming in, and it's like. I want to do the film. So, you know, I've been working on this film for a long time. That And that's kind of where, I, where even if I'm not the mo- most well-known for my own filmmaking, it's still where my, what it is that I, I find myself thinking on some level about most. I mean, I get distracted. I, I've been enjoying working on American Gods and I like playing, playing the character. Um, but on some level, I'm, I know I'm thinking about ultimately going back and working on, on my film. Crispin, thank you so much for setting aside so much time for me. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure to talk to you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. you too. Yeah, and see you, uh, see you next week. Right? All right, good. Yeah, come up and say hello. Definitely, will do. Okay. Thank All you right. so much. Take care. Right, you too. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>